So uh, I have no slides for this session because, well, I didn't have time to write slides. Uh, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, today we're going to kind of talk about uh, using operations management suite to generate alerts, send them over to Azure Automation, and then run runbooks for remediation. Uh, how many people here are familiar with OMS, using it actively in your environment? Okay. Um, so, Operations Management Suite has some really good plugins for Azure Automation. Um, once you get a uh, OMS workspace set up, you can actually uh, connect your uh, Azure Automation runbooks, your storage accounts, stuff like that, in order to be able to better manage uh, the environment. Now, they've kind of moved some stuff around, so uh, it's a little bit more difficult here to, to traverse, but let me go ahead and just show you what the looks like in the Azure Automation account itself. Do, 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 do. So once you get a workspace set up, uh, you can actually connect it, connect it through, oh, I hope I saved that run book. Um, you can actually connect it through uh, the Azure uh, Automation account directly. So uh, it'll just ask you what workspace you want to connect to, and then you know it gets plugged directly in. Now, once once you actually have this set up, you can actually get into Operations Management Suite and start setting up your own custom alerts. Uh, one of the things that I did in order to be able to start generating alerts, and I don't recommend you do this in your production environment, but I built a virtual machine, set up 3389 out to the open internet, um, which believe it or not, a lot of people like to try to see if they can get into those virtual machines when they're opened up to the internet. So I went ahead and uh, basically went into my log search or uh, got my security alerting here and was able to start building kind of my own little query on these incoming malicious IPs. Internet's a little bit slow. Let me go ahead and uh, close out some of my doodads here. Okay, there we go. So as we can see, it's actually got uh, notable issues. And hey, look, it tells you when incoming malicious IPs are generated. The nice thing is, is that it actually kind of gives you a uh, general query that it's running to, to be able to take note and say, hey, uh, you've got you know, some stuff here that you're going to want to look at. But we can actually take that query and gen generalize it. So go into Notepad here, just kind of take it. And anything that's really relatively specific, uh, you can go ahead and generalize. So uh, turn People's Republic of China into star. Um, you know, uh, maybe you want specific IPs or anything like that. Now, th there's just about as much like science uh, or is about as much art as there is science into building these alerts. So there's a lot of experimentation involved. Uh, what you wind up building is a generalized query that you can test in your uh, alerting. So I'm going to just go ahead and scrape what I've got in my search here. Do, 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 do. And we can see here um, this is a little bit more generalized. So uh, I don't really have any specific um, you know, countries or anything like that listed. So I can go ahead and grab this alert go into my log search and pull it up. Once I get back into the window. I do apologize. I had this to be a little bit more of a structured talk, but uh, my demo environment exploded on me late last night, and I didn't catch it until this morning. So we're kind of going through more of the thought processes and stuff. Although I kind of feel that um, I'm hoping that that'll actually open this up to a little bit more of a conversative uh, session. So I go ahead and paste that in there. I run my query. And you can see that I'm actually getting valid data out of it. Now, 
once you've got this query built up, you can actually go ahead and start building your own alerts. And it doesn't have to be security stuff. It can be service stoppages. It can be maybe you have SQL servers in the environment and it runs a certain amount of CPU and you want to be able to auto remediate that stuff. Um, I actually like this kind of alerting just because when I'm showing it off to like exec, you know, C-level execs and security guys, uh, their eyes get really wide when you see how many times a box has been attacked. But, um, you know, basically it's, it's relatively simple to go ahead and generate uh, these alert rules. So you just take that query that you've built and you throw it in here. Uh, you give it a name, obviously, and a time window. Um, and have it check for, you know, that alert every so often and then based on a number of results. And of course I have it set for greater than zero. So if I get one alert or one result, it's gonna go ahead and generate that alert. Um, and then, of course, what you want to do, obviously, there's a, a number of different uh, options that you can select. You can have it notify you by email. Uh, you can have it plugged directly into ITSM. So if you got, like, uh, uh, oh, dear, what's it called? Like ServiceNow or something along those lines. A lot of the newer ITSM tools have direct connectors, so it can go ahead and generate tickets and alerts. But what we're looking at is the runbook. Now, once you've connected to that workspace in your Azure subscription uh, for your uh, automation account, it will automatically show up in here. And basically, if you have multiple automation accounts, you get a little bit of a drop-down box. And then same thing with the, uh, the run book. When you first create it, you'll get a drop-down box, and you'll be able to select exactly what you want there. Once it's saved, all the stuff is locked in. So if you go to the wrong run book or anything like that, you're gonna have to actually create a new alert. So, which is why you can see in here, I've got like 50 million alerts uh, configured. So uh, it takes a little bit of experimentation, but once you finally start having that process down, uh, you're okay. Now, what do we do with the run book? So the run book, essentially the way OMS notifies Azure Automation to perform an action via runbook is it uses what's called a webhook. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what a webhook at its very basic looks like, uh, the type of information that you need in order to be able to get out of it, and then how to be able to process that information and then run the appropriate commands to get stuff done. Is anybody here not familiar with JSON? Okay, excellent. So this is uh, basically a test JSON construct that I created in order to be able to test and validate my uh, automation runbook code. Obviously, you need a webhook name uh, and then a, you know, information in your request header and request body. Uh, for the purpose of this runbook, what the runbook does is it actually is designed when it gets this malicious IP uh, you know, alert the run book that I have created will actually create a network security group to block any inbound traffic from that source IP. So the two things that we need are the computer name uh, for this construct and malicious IP. Uh, you could generalize it to update a specific network security group with additional rules. Uh, this one I just have targeting the computer. Now, from the perspective of the run book, do, do, do. nope, that's work. This is uh, what I've got coming in. Where are my run books? I can't find my run books today. I feel like I should be singing a song or something while I'm doing this. No, I didn't have time. <laughs> Which is probably why my demo environment exploded on me this afternoon. 
So uh, the incoming webhook data is processed as a general object. So that's why you'll see the, the parameter there for object. Um, is anybody not created a runbook before? Okay. So uh, in general, and you'll see this when you create a new Azure automation account, if you go to the runbooks, it'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one of the things that you'll see that it first processes is to uh, run as the Azure Run As connection. Uh, this uh, will actually invoke the Azure Run As account in order to be able to act on your behalf when it's triggering a runbook. This uh, basically gives the Run As, the run as account when it's created uh, has the ability to create objects, uh, process configurations, all kinds of different things. So when you're generating a runbook, uh, it's going to ask you what that is. When you first create an automation account, you have Azure Run As account or Run As connection. So that's the one we're invoking here. This run book is a little bit uh, generalized. I just kind of wanted to put it all together to, to show you what, uh, you know, what all of this it looks like and how it works. So basically what we're doing is we're taking that JSON object and we're converting it into something that's a little bit more usable. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and parse out that webhook name, the request header and body, so we can go ahead and get a little bit of information. And then I'm using write output, just basically so when I run the run book, I can see what information is being processed when and make sure that the data that's coming through is entirely valid. And then of course, I created a uh, commandlet uh, to uh, essentially configure that NSG rule for me. So everybody pray to the demo gods because it worked this morning. Oh, well, it's probably not gonna work when I don't give it any valid data. So we're gonna go ahead and snag this. Stop. We're gonna take our uh, test JSON data, we're gonna put it into the parameter and of course, wait for it to stop being queued and explode because I pushed start too soon. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right. So what can uh, OMS alerts do for us? Well, actually, they, they can do a lot of things. Uh, if you have the OMS clients installed on your virtual machines, you get things like health data, health information. Um, you know, you can get, you know, service information, anything like that. And then, you know, you can kind of craft uh, run books to be able to auto-remediate a lot of different things. Uh, some of the, the customers that I've worked with, we've actually gone so far uh, with it to where if they get any type of an error from their service information, uh, we've built run books for them to actually completely deploy brand spanking new VMs with DSC configurations and everything into the environment because they don't even want to pay their, their operations guys to troubleshoot an issue for eight hours when they can just deploy the new VM in 30 minutes. So it's, um, it's really extensible and flexible as to what you can do. Um, wow, it's really hanging on there. Yeah, stop. There we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull the trigger on that and hopefully we'll get some information out of it here relatively soon. Now, one of the things that I really, really like about Runbooks is regardless if you're running it in a test or production uh, mode, uh, you can get some really, really verbose output. Um, so as this is processing, anything that we do as far as like with write output, it's going to be generated to here, but it's also going to be uh, thrown out into some of the output logs. So that way, if it's in the middle of the night and the run book triggers automatically, um, you can actually go back and review all of the steps that it took, provided that you're actually writing that verbose output. Yay, we're running. Everybody say yay. Yay. <laughs> so you can see here, this is where it's uh, using that run as credential to go ahead and log into the uh, Azure environment. Uh, I've got my JSON data here, so you can see that it's actually gone ahead and built uh, some of my data. 
and then it's going to go ahead and hit it here saying that the rule with the specified name already exists because I've already run this with the IP address before. But I, I'm going to say I wanted that just to kind of show you guys what, what it does when it term, throws a terminating error. But you can see here where it's gone ahead and generated all of this data from that verbose output. So we've got the webhook data, um, which you, know, you want to be able to, to kind of see uh, that data that's incoming. I've got my write output, so it gives me all of that information. Now I know, just looking at it, that I have valid data coming through, and this is really important. And I'm going to start talking about some of the, uh, the constructs that OMS will pass over and some of the things that you have to look for. And then you can see here when it ran the command, this was the output that uh, I have written into it to say this is what I'm trying to build. Now if I go back and update this, yep, yep, yep. and we're going to just go ahead and say 2.1. I shouldn't have this rule here. As an aside, if you want your run books to run faster, uh, hybrid workers, uh, which are essentially dedicated VMs um, that are designated to, to process uh, things from Azure Automation do actually return a, a faster, you know, you get a faster return process out of it. Uh, part of the reason why you'll get a lot of queuing and kind of waiting on a run book if you don't have one of these hybrid run, run book or hybrid workers is because um, on the back end when you commit to a, a job the uh, automation account has to actually spin up like a containerized VM to actually process the, the runbook information. So if you're processing a ton of stuff, I highly, highly, highly recommend uh, getting uh, a hybrid worker into the environment. So you can see here we've actually got a new output. Uh, this tells me that it actually did in fact create a new security group role. Um, and it's got all of the information down in here, uh, primarily because my uh, function actually calls the new Azure RM network security group rule uh, command. But we can see all of the data that's been generated here, and then we can also go ahead and take a look at that virtual machine. Go into networking and then we can go ahead and see that that rule has been generated. So we've done it with the basic data. Uh, let me go ahead and talk about what it looks like when OMS generates webhook data. Uh, I highly recommend, if you're gonna do anything with webhooks, that you want to, to actually kind of have one of these little JSON constructs to do your testing in. Number, yes? Yes. 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 Yeah, and, uh, it, like I don't see everything in OMS automatically getting shipped over all at once. So, and there's going to probably be other use cases for webhooks going down the line as well. Yes. I don't know how much I can speak to that. Yeah. So, yeah. I, yeah. Anyway, so you're kind of right, and I'm, I'm, I, I can't get into details. Uh, so, anyway, um, but OMS, to be clear, is not going away. Um, so anyway, uh, here's the, the little JSON object here. Uh, it, like I said, you want to test your run, but if you're using J, uh, webhooks, you want to create your own test JSON object. 
part of that is because it sometimes takes a while for OMS to be able to process an alert, but you also have to wait for that alert to actually happen uh, before you know it triggers. So you don't want to necessarily use that as your test case because if it explodes, then you have to wait for the next alert cycle for, for anything to come in. So highly recommend going ahead and uh, creating your own JSON object to pass it through. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, actual runs. So I have another one here where I was just basically uh, capturing it, and this is the one that exploded. But we can go ahead and take a look into the jobs here, and you can see that I had an, you know, an incoming alert at 12.04 a.m., and uh, it did throw a, a ton of errors, but this is where I wanted to kind of show you what you know, that you can go back to these previous jobs and see what the output is. So this is really important for, you know, being able to go back forensically and, you know, take a look at a, you know, what went on. More importantly, I wanted to show you what the webhook data looks like incoming. Kind of a mess. Um, so this is where it, it gets to be really important to test with your test JSON object uh, for the webhook. So because it, Parsing sometimes can be a little bit problematic with OMS, uh, but the other thing that you want to do is make sure that the data <clears throat> that you're going to be feeding into your Azure Automation Runbook is actually, in fact, valid. So uh, you may grab, you know, if you're looking for like computer name and IP address, well, you, know, you might have to sort for some type of a, a sub-object inside of the um, request data. So if we go through here, do, 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 you'll see, actually it might not even be passing the IP address and that might be why it blew up. Ah, here we go. So what, what you wanna be able to do, and this is kinda why I craft my run books to be able to output that data is to be able to see exactly how OMS is presenting it. Now, depending on the type of alert that you're using, um, that data may be formatted differently. So uh, I always start small, uh, you know, process the object, give me what the actual output of the object is, and then once I have a run book with all of those references, I can go through, pick and choose the data that I want, and then have it formatted properly. Does that make sense to you guys? All right, cool. Getting a lot of nodding. Uh, so, questions? So basically the, the OMS VM agent is pretty much the same agent as SCOM. Um, so it can pull data. I haven't seen an agent that can actually reach in and execute. The closest thing that I've seen is with like the PowerShell web, the Power, Azure PowerShell console. You have things like av enter Azure RMVM but I don't think that commandlet is designed to actually process on behalf of the Azure Run As account. That would be an interesting experiment to try. So let's try an experiment. Um, anybody here not familiar with the, the Azure PowerShell console? Okay. So there's a PowerShell console that exists in Azure. Um, if you click on the, the little PowerShell button here. The, the only way I can potentially see this working, so with Enter Azure RMVM, you have, it's essentially leveraging enter PS session, okay? 
so, and actually, I don't think it'll work in my instance because I don't have 5985 open. Um, but, so some caveats, you, you know, you have to have the firewall configured to allow 5985 uh, for HTTP PowerShell. Um, you would have to pass a credential and then be able to execute the runbook. What I don't know is if Azure Automation can actually leverage that command. So you'd have to experiment with it. Right, but you could store the credential in an Azure Automation credential. So let me go ahead and show you guys what that is. I like this, now we're actually getting into like experiments and stuff. Um, so you have credential, so you have key vault, but you also have automation credentials. I usually tend to tell people to use the automation credentials more than key vault, just because with key vault, you have the ability to unobfuscate the password. Uh, whereas the, the credentials here, you can see that even though I'm the, the owner of the subscription, I can't actually peel that away. Um, and it's actually really good to use in automation runbooks and also DSC configurations because you can invoke it with get automation PS credential and then pass that credential object directly in and it never gets processed out in the open. Uh, so it an automation account can uh, execute anywhere inside the subscription. It's not limited to VNets or resource groups. Yes. It actually, for the most part, doesn't care. Um, most of the executions happen underneath at the subscription level. Now, if you were to get Enter Azure RM VM uh, working through a runbook that may, uh, although, yeah, I think that's something that I, I might actually bring that to the Azure Automation team and say, you know what, this this would be kind of cool if it doesn't work. So it, that's something I'm going to have to experiment with. Yes, because your security people are 90 years old and they think their environment's a lot more secure. Uh, so basically, we just have to use an on prem Yeah. And because your security people are 90 years old and don't understand that the credentials exist in memory, and that's a bad thing. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, and in, in this kind of speaks back to one of the things that uh, I, I've been pushing heavily with a lot of customers, too, is, is using Azure Automation a lot more for not just uh, automating and remediating my cloud environments or their cloud environments, but also handling their on-prem stuff. Um, a lot of this stuff with a, with a hybrid, one, especially with the hybrid run, run, book or, uh, run, book. Yeah, run book worker, sorry, I can't talk today, um, it gives you some really, really good management capabilities over secure connection. 99% of the stuff operates over 443 TLS. Um, it's private public key auth when you register a machine uh, it exchanges its own certificate with Azure Automation. No, you don't get a hold of it. So if your 90-year-old security guy wants a listing of all of those certificates, guess what? Tough. Um, but yeah, it, it actually gives you the ability to very, very securely uh, manage a lot of different things. DSC configurations. Anybody here run pool server? Yeah. Um, when you generate a MOF on your pull server, it's in plain text, right? Yeah, these are encrypted end-to-end. -end. So the, the MOFs are actually encrypted in 
uh, Azure Automation, and then through the public-private key auth that it uses for pull, it'll decrypt it in memory, run the configuration, and then it scrubs it. So, and that's another thing that is insanely hard to hijack. So, you know, your on-prem pull server, which is essentially a file share, can be hijacked. Uh, these really, really can't. Uh, actually, even being the owner of a DSC config, and I'd be more than happy to show you one, except for I've got some customer ones on here. Um, but, you know, even after, like, even myself owning the subscription, uh, when I generate the MOF file, I cannot see that plain text MOF file. I can put credentials into it. I can, you know, I can go ahead and give it the configuration, but once the MOF is generated, I cannot take it apart. I cannot even see it. I can't download it. Nothing. Um, and moreover, because, well, I'm a nerd and I manage my, uh, you know, laptop with DSC in the cloud, I can go out and do, see, configuration and ah <laughs> I'm not happening Yeah, that's what it looks like. Fully encrypted end to end. So you can tell your 90 year old security guys, yeah, your pull server doesn't do that. Um, so I, I know we kind of went a little bit off topic, uh, but I, I just kind of wanted to walk you through some of the, like I said, the, the constructs and the, the mentality of uh, OMS and connecting it to an aut automation runbook. Uh, do you have any questions so far? in regards to that? Yes, yes they can. Uh, actually, pretty much, I haven't seen any place where the creds can't be leveraged. Anyone else? You got me for another 12 minutes and I'm not very good at dancing. Oh God, no. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, you know, the really where, where it gets into the, the science and voodoo is crafting your alerts. Uh, the only thing that I can say is go through the visuals. Um, you know, if you're looking for particulars, the, you know, OMS and even like the Azure alerting and monitoring has a really great functionality in order to be able to drill down, get the particulars, and it shows you the queries along the way. So that way you can go ahead and grab the information out of those. Very easy to generalize and then start testing. Um, once again, when you're building your runbook, use generic JSON inputs for testing. And then once you think you've got it fine-tuned to where it should be, go ahead and connect that uh, alert up to the runbook, execute it. But also, more importantly, make sure you've got some kind of verbose output to say, okay, this is what the object looks like coming in. Um, like I said, it's very easy to take a look and see what the input object looks like um, through the input parameters so you can get that data there. But also, after you've processed it uh, with the runbook, make sure that you know the the data that you want is actually being formatted the way that you want it. That's pretty much it. Any other questions? Actually, any questions in Azure Automation in general?
Mostly. Um, and actually, I, I can refer you to, uh, to my blog, blog series over on PowerShell.org about some of the stuff that I do. Primarily, the stuff that's in the Azure Automation runbooks uh, is where you're going to be doing PowerShell. You can actually import and export those runbooks from your local machine into uh, Azure Automation. But uh, really, um, most of the stuff as far as like getting, getting and formatting your queries, unless you're really, really, really good at SQL, which I'm awful, uh, you're going to be doing it through the GUI. And uh, I kind of highly recommend it because you, you get that data back in real time to make sure you're actually getting what you want. Um, as far as connecting Azure Automation to an OMS account, you can do it through PowerShell. It's uh, basically just a one-liner. But you have to scrape the workspace ID and key, which GUI. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of a mix of both. You're going to be doing a lot of stuff in the UI. OMS, in general, is really designed for the UI user. Um, now, the Azure Monitor stuff, you know, you can get a lot of good data via PowerShell out of that. So it, it's going to be kind of that balance of where do you want to get your data from. Ultimately, the alerting and passing it into the run books, the mechanisms work the same. Um, and, you know, uh, actually with Azure Monitor, it's a little bit easier to build because you can invoke it directly off of that query. But uh, the nice thing about playing around with the webhooks, too, is you might not necessarily be using OMS. There's other things that can execute and transmit webhooks that Azure Automation can ingest. So this is a good way to kind of familiarize yourself with how do those webhooks work, how can I format that data, and then use it to execute my commands. Any scum people in here that can answer that? And to be clear also, the, the OMS agent, because it's so similar to SCOM, it's really pretty much the same thing. It's just got the, the ability to add an OMS workspace key and ID. Uh, you can actually multi-home it. So you can have it reporting to an OMS workspace as well as an on-prem SCOM server. So you, know, it, you can kind of get that flexibility in there as well. Yeah. Yes. And it depends on the rev too. Although the it's been like what three years since they implemented that, so pretty much if you're on on current branch, you should be able to multi-home it. But if you're on like Scum 2007, eh, probably not. So. Any questions? Uh, 
Oh, so from a DSC perspective, um, when so basically whenever I go to compile uh, a configuration, uh, it'll go ahead and um, generate a MOF in Azure Automation, and the MOF is encrypted there. Now, uh, PowerShell 5, yes, uh, since PowerShell 5, they've actually been encrypting current.mof uh, on the machine. So that's what allows you to have that encrypted current.mof. Uh, the, where it's not encrypted is if you're using an on-prem pool server, the MOF is actually stored in plain text. And to be, to be true, uh, the, the, the pool server code that you know, has been provided is considered test code and not actually really supported by Microsoft. So it was just kind of developed as an example. Uh, if you really want that true secure end-to-end -end, um, capability, the, the, the general recommendation for now is, is to leverage Azure Automation DSC because it has that end-to-end -end encryption. Not necessarily. Um, it really depends on how the org is built. Uh, so, like for example, yeah, you know, let's say we're we're dealing with like uh, something that's got multiple storefronts, and a lot of those storefronts are connected over, uh, you know, uh, global internet. You might actually configure those machines to directly interact with Azure Automation and not necessarily use a uh, hybrid worker. Now, the, the hybrid worker actually kind of serves a couple of different roles. Uh, it can be used for runbook processing, just so you don't have to deal with the queuing and waiting for that, that VM to spin up. Uh, but it can also be used to issue marching orders uh, from Azure Automation to your on-prem boxes. And this is really where I see it being used more often is because, you know, for some reason security people don't like it when your servers are talking directly to the open internet. Um, so what they'll do instead is they'll use that hybrid worker in a DMZ environment to basically act as the pass through and issue more marching orders. Now, if the, if the site configuration is that way, I would say that uh, you might want to position a hybrid worker for each data center to be your front-facing point. Uh, as far as like limitations of clients, I haven't seen any ceilings yet. So, um, you know, I, I've seen them being used in environments where it's like three or four thousand nodes, um, and not seen it like completely explode, but. It also depends on how often that stuff is processing, because more often than not, uh, a lot of those data, like a lot of my clients' data centers, haven't fully implemented uh, using Azure Automation for on-prem stuff. It's more experimental, so you might see only a hundred or two hundred nodes. It depends on what you're kicking. So patch management usually needs a little bit of scheduling ahead of time, and there's some check-ins involved with that, so 30 minutes to an hour. Um, I have seen, because we, we, I have done implementations where it was like Azure Automation in Azure Cloud managing virtual machines that were in like 21 Vianet, and that can take an insanely long time, but that's primarily because of the firewall. Um, now, if you're talking like DSC configuration, that's going to be whenever you execute up to 30 minutes uh, for it to be able to pull its refresh. Uh, for an Azure Automation runbook, usually less than three to five minutes. Um, and it depends on scope and scale, too, because it's got to be able to issue the marching orders across, and there's going to be some balancing in between. Once again, it depends. 
Uh, so as far as I know, unless the, the pricing's been updated, patch management is still free across the board. Uh, for desired state configuration, all Azure VMs are free. On-prem, it's based on compute hour. So, and it's prorated. So if you have, typically the, the boxes will do a refresh every 30 minutes and check in every 15, or run a consistency every 15. Um, that equals about $6 per month per node. Uh, however, if you scale it back to where it's only checking in like once or twice a day, then that significantly drops it down. It's like 50 cents per month per node which is generally where I see the most of my clients going for their non-critical stuff. And what they'll do is they'll actually, based on the criticality of the server, they may actually change the LCM configuration. So maybe they have something that is like PCI DSS compliance and they want that constant auditing and reporting. So they'll go ahead and pay the $6 per month per node for that. But this other thing is like a file and print server and they don't necessarily care, so it's checking in once a day. So it depends on the service. Any other questions? All right, well, it's 1246. Thank you for suffering with me, even though my demo blew up.